as we are getting into December, you must be wondering why I'm wearing this lovely Christmas shirt. I don't often get a chance to wear these lovely Christmas shirts and since December is such a short month, I thought I'd use this a few times uh, to do the next few videos. So we are getting into almost the middle of winter and you must be wondering, is it safe to work on trees at this time of the year? In case I give you the wrong impression, um, I work throughout the year and I'm very fortunate that I have a large greenhouse which is unheated, it does go to freezing, but during the day when the outside temperature is about say, say four or five degrees, the inside temperature is a couple of degrees higher and throughout the winter, even during the daytime, it doesn't freeze solid entirely. So this protection is perfect for trees that I work on. So my answer to your question is that if you work on your trees during December and January, as long as you can protect it in a plastic tunnel or an unheated greenhouse, or even in the shed during the periods of hard frost, you will be okay. The trees should not die. So here we are. What I'm going to show you today are most people would call impossible pines. If you look at straggly thing like this, you must be wondering, what can I do with it? These, by the way, we grew ourselves some seed. This is about six, maybe seven years old from seed and we just left them out in the field to grow and look at this. This is a Leylandii, the dreaded hedging Leylandii. Seed has sprouted and it is growing next to this plant. So we just leave them to grow and when they're big enough we take them up and uh, make bonsai from them. So I'm going to work on, hopefully, five or six pines. So this is going to be a longish video. These are also mugo pines, but these have been grown by a wholesale nursery to contract. So they grow them for us, but it's exactly the same as the ones I grew from seed, except that they're probably grown a bit better and more intensively. So let's have a look at these mugo pines. Although this is the mugo pine, this is just the wild mugo pine, the unnamed variety. There are lots and lots of different mugos. The ones which I have been working on quite a lot are these ones, which is called mugo mops. And they are grafted onto either Scots pine stock or mugo stock. And you can see that they're quite different because that's got a much tighter character, very dense character, tight foliage, whereas the ordinary wild mugo seedlings or the unnamed varieties are more lax and open, almost like the Scots pine habit. So we are not talking of the mugo mops, but just the ordinary mugo. So I have here five mugos and maybe one other pine, and I will go through all of them one at a time. So let's deal with this one first. So let me talk a little bit about tools first. In case many of you are put off by buying bonsai tools or having to buy bonsai tools, I am only going to use the Felco secateurs. I have a pair of bonsai trimming scissors as well, but I may not need to use that. Gin pliers also I may not need to use. Wire cutters I have, I may not even need to use this because the Felco secateurs can cut wire. The rake, of course. So possibly just these two tools we will use for the entire demonstration. Just to show you that you don't need to buy all these expensive tools. I have here stainless steel, twig shears, gin pliers, hybrid stainless steel cutter, branch splitter. All these are tools which are very useful, but for most beginners, you don't need that. So I'm doing myself in, I'm not selling tools. And uh, I'm just showing you that you can get away with virtually very simple um, gardening tools to make your bonsai. But wire is absolutely essential. If you try to make bonsai without wire, it is almost impossible. So wire is very essential. Now, what grades of wire to use? 
I always tell people that a lot of uh, the decision as to what wire to use is common sense. So to reiterate again, to hammer home the point, common sense means that if you want to bend, say, a trunk like that, I am not going to use something which is too thick. This is about four, four and a half. It will do it, but you don't need that. It could do something uh, much thinner. But the most common size of wire I find is two millimeter, two and a half millimeter. This is two millimeter, two and a half millimeter, and three millimeter for this sort of tree. But again, you've got to adapt it as you go along. So this tree is what we would call a very simple and obvious one. It's got a nice single trunk. And you've got these walls of branches, one, two, three, four, very typical of pines. And people are often confused as to what to do with them. And then again, another wall of branches there. So the first thing I do, as always, is to take them out of the pot, see how well grown they are. There's traces of mycelium as well. And the surface roots are pretty good here, so I don't have to go too far below that. And I always pluck some of the needles so that I can wire some of the trunk. So don't have too many needles too close to the start of the branches. So this will make the wiring a bit easier and I don't trap too many needles. So keep most of the needles at the tips of the branches. So for ladies it's like plucking eyebrow. And if you want to give this a nice bend, we will wire the trunk first. Always wire the trunk first and then wire the branches. Because when you come to undoing the wire, it's easier to undo the wire on the branches first and then go to uh, the trunk, undo the trunk. Now, although this is three mil, I think three mil, on judging that, I think I need three and a half mil. So, this is where you literally have to decide on the spot. The length of wire I'm going to use is about the same length because I'm not going to go right to the very end. So, with the Felco secateurs, there's always that little a bit there which you can use for cutting the wire, the notch we call it. And then we will stick the wire into the soil. Pardon me if I'm not working from the back of the tree, I find that very, very difficult. But I hope you can see what I'm doing. and keep the wire really, really tight. Every time I do a video, even if I'm repeating similar topics, they are all slightly different in their own way, so you will learn something new every time. So once that wire is put on, we will give it a little twist to make it more interesting. A curvy trunk line is always more interesting than one which is dead straight, although not all trees have to be absolutely straight. I will now prop the tree up this way so that I get some ideas to the angle of planting when I come to planting it in the final bonsai pot. So that angle would be about right. And then I proceed to wire the branches. Now let's see how I think when I decide to wire the branches. Okay, let me place the branches and see whether I need them all. There are two coming out from the back. Although it will fill a space, I'm not sure if I will need all the four. I'll probably use three. So. 
it's deciding whether I keep this or keep this. So if I eliminate this, it'll look like this. If I eliminate this, it'll look like this. So I think this looks a bit better. So I will eliminate this. I hope you got that. Off it goes. And now we use the two millimeter wire, the length of wire, almost the length of the two branches because I'm not going to go to the very end, I'm going to loop it. So again, remember the two branch principle, meaning you wire two branches, what one piece of wire. That is what the two branch principle means. Very important to remember that. You will inevitably manage to wrap some of the needles, but no harm is done. Those needles will probably drop off and next to you will get a lot of new buds. So the main thing is structuring the tree at this stage. I'm still removing some needles where I can. Okay, those have been put in place, so that's your first branch. Although this is the front and these branches coming out at the back, I'm not that bothered. You're, usually they come from the front, but although they're splayed from the back, at least it still gives that nice open welcoming arm feeling. Now what do I do this with the single branch? Because I always tell people to do two branches, one piece of wire. So can I still do the two branch principle? Yes, you can. What you do is you wire a branch that has already been done. So this branch has already been wired. So I will wire this one. So that is acting as the second branch. And then I go to this unwired branch. So I'm still using two branch principle. Although the branch that I have already anchored to has been wired, but no matter, I'm still providing the anchor. Okay, wire that, it's pretty straight, but you can zigzag it and shorten it and make it more interesting. So zigzagging meaning you do that, like that and like that. Make it curvy rather than straight. Okay, so I'll zigzag that. These will wire later on flat. Now the next branch is this one and this one. So these two will form a nice adjacent pair. I'm still using two mil wire. Two mil, as I say, is probably the most used wire in bonsai. If you need to buy wire and lots of it, two mil is the size to get. Okay, so to wire these two, I will have to go from here and up the trunk. So when I go up the trunk, I will follow the path of the main trunk wire so that it looks neat, like so. So it doesn't cross. And then I go on to the next one above. And then the next one is this pair. So it all falls very logically. Now these two, although it's not really a branch, I can wire those two. And this one I will probably shift to, oh, I can still use the two mil one. Although two mil is getting a bit thick, no matter, I will still do that.
young plants like this, I find that if you leave the wire on for just a year, it will shape it. Now this is a bit too thin. I have to go for slightly thinner wire. Let me find some scraps of wire. And the top, I will do with just one piece of wire, which is a one and a half mil wire. So that is that done and if I want to pot it, I can easily put it in that sort of pot. So I can do that. So there are many different sizes of pots I can use, even that pot is quite comfortable. Uh, I think I will just be a bit cautious and not tease the roots. I know I can do it at this time of the year. Well, why not? I will do it because let me practice what I preach because I have the benefit of this greenhouse so I don't think it will come to any harm. So all these trees which are grown well, you see how strong the roots are. Very, very strong roots. And it's got such a lot of root that even if you took some of it off, it won't hurt the tree. You usually can judge a strong tree growing like this if you can be bold enough to take some root off, it won't hurt the tree. So look at all that root, look at all that root. Well grown, extremely well grown. And I know I shouldn't be using my twig cutting shears, but it's already on hand, I'll just cut it. That's the mount I'm going to cut, cutting all that off. And then I'll just try it in this pot, so it'll go in this pot quite comfortably. After all, these trees are just in their first stage of training, so I'm not that fussed. So I will tie it in when I get to finalizing it. I'm just trying it for size for the time being. It will fit in this very comfortably. So that's the sort of size of pot I would choose, even though it's not the final pot, it is almost there. Some of these side branches you can wire with very fine wire and complete it like that. So that one is done, so easy to do. Again, if I didn't talk so much, I could do this certainly in five minutes. Okay, now let's go to the next one because every tree is different. The more I work on different trees, the more you will get to see the uh, variations that you get and you won't be put off by it because every situation is different and we will tackle each one as we go along. Now this one has a wall of branches, that means like a fan shape with lots and lots of branches all coming out from the same point. I still remember back in the 70s in the bonsai community in the UK, people just put these in little pots, little pie dishes and they called it bonsai. In fact, this would look very natural as a bonsai without much wiring. Let me see what it would look like. Again, so well grown, beautiful roots, a bit of mycelium, that white stuff, beneficial fungus. And again, the soil in which it is grown is just the uh, sphagnum moss peat with some bark. I can cut all that off, don't need all that. If you came across this in the woods, it would be a natural tree, isn't it? Let me just see. Why do we have to wire everything? We're just creating something beautiful. I think too often we're always obsessed with wiring 
points in the standard shape that conforms to bonsai but we can be a bit unconventional and let's see how we can make this look like a real miniature tree without going to the lengths of doing too much wiring because the tree will look quite nice as it is. So what I would do is I would probably open it out a little more. So this is almost like a broom style pine which for most people pines are not usually grown as a broom style but again if you think of it in nature you do find pines that grow like this. So let me just tidy up the dead twigs that are in here. What have I done? Virtually nothing. Maybe I will open it up with one piece of wire. Let me find some one and a half wire. This is one and a half millimeter wire. I will probably open that up. But this is a case where this tree certainly doesn't need wiring. So if someone came on one of my classes and picked a tree like this and there was nothing to do, they might ask for their money back because they've done no practice. I wouldn't do more than that. It looks very nice. So even that single piece of wire I used was not needed. I didn't do any magic. You saw what I did right through the process. It was just teasing the roots out and putting it in a pot. So this tree has a different character to that one. And you can't say one is better than the other, but they all have different characters. So they are different and they're both nice. So that's the second tree. Now let's see what the third one has to offer. This one, I must admit, is more complicated. This is very, very complicated. This seems to have been chopped over there at some stage and all the little branches have sprung up like that. But if you think about it, those of you who have got more experience of mugo pines will realize that mugo pines do grow in this crazy fashion. You know, they've got branches all over the place and they creep and crawl all over. So this is typical of how mugo pines grow. In fact, we have some growing around our pond and they grow like this. So let me take it out of the pot and see what is underneath. Again, look at that beautiful mycelium. All that white is the beneficial fungus, sign of a healthy tree. I will use some of that back in the compost so that it will behave like a yeast and uh, spread more and more. What I'm going to do with this tree, when I get situations like this, and many of you will know the way I work, I don't try and draw a design of how I envisage the pine to turn out. I will just work and go along and see what emerges, what evolves from the tree. So the best thing I can do is to wire every single branch. And when I say every single branch, I'm going to find pairs of branches. So this and this is similar thickness. That and that is similar. So I will find branches of similar thickness because I need to use the appropriate wire for that particular branch. So this first or the thickest branch, I will use two and half millimeter wire, two and half. You notice I haven't used the wire cutters. I'm just using the secateurs to cut the wire. Okay, I'm going to wire that one and this one. The first time I saw these plants was this morning. I haven't studied it at all. OK. 
here. Plucking the needles as I go along. I'm beginning to think whether the why I use this strong enough, but let's see. If it doesn't do, I'll use a double. I could have used something thicker, but let's see if this does it. I think it should hold. Okay, I will continue using the two and a half mil wire and I will find another pair. So those two pairs. So always in pairs. I notice some of these shoots are about four to six inches long and this is all this year's growth. So this piece here would have been a small candle back in April and it's grown to at least six inches. Many of you, I don't know whether you criticize me or not for using both metric and imperial inches and centimeters but I use both. Because some people only think in terms of the imperial inches and others think in terms of metric. But because I was taught in school in imperial, I still prefer the imperial, but I also do understand the other system. Okay, I won't try to bend anything just yet. I'm just wiring every pair together. So the next pair, this one. So let's use this. That's another pair and then I've got one final pair here. So luckily we've got one, two, three, four pairs of wires. But as I said, it doesn't matter if you don't have pairs because you can always wire to a branch that has already been wired and still achieve the two branch principle.
Okay, so we've now wired all the pairs of branches. It still looks a mess, but just by manipulating the wire, let's see what shape emerges. It is literally by trial and error. Keep wiring or twisting the branches to see what emerges from that. So this one I've already got this sort of shape, very tight shape. And these fine ones, I think I should also wire, because that will make it look complete. Wherever there are branches, just wire them. Now this is a three branch situation, so there's one on its own, so I will just wire that. I'm wiring the apex to bring the apex back up this way. This one on its own is not wired, but it's staying in the right position, so I'd leave that. Uh, probably take this off. And now I'm just going to shorten the ends. A lot of people are afraid of tipping the pines, but I find that with Mugo pines and Scots pines, if you just tip the ends, it does encourage bud back further along the branch or the trunk. So you don't have to wait for the candles to come. Many people are obsessed by just plucking the candles, but at some stage you don't just pluck candles, you have to take the end of the branch off to keep it compact. So this is what I've done here. Now, this is, can almost be like a semi-cascade if we plant it in a deep pot. So this is cascading down, or it can just be a wide sweeping pine so more or less like a informal upright. Let's try and put it in a pot and see what effect I get. So I will again loosen some of this root ball. Now let's see if I can get it into a cascade pot. This is a ceramic cascade pot. So take some of those roots off. It's not a full cascade, it's a semi-cascade. This cascade pot narrows a lot at the base, so the root ball has to be severely dealt with. But let me try this pot. This may be more comfortable for the tree. I think I'll try this one. It's probably a bit better. I won't have to cut so much root. I will do the final potting later on. Again, using the same compost. It's just that 
I don't want to spend too much time tying it in and all that. It's just to show you what it looks like. trying to squash it so that it leans slightly to the left. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm using this cascade pot because I don't want all the trees to look like identi identical clones. I want something different just to show you what variations you can get from these pines. This branch we could remove if you want to show the trunk. If you want to look at more, look at it, and see more density, I do do that. So there are many, many choices. I can bring it slightly like this. So I haven't cut a single branch off. And yet I've got a different style of tree. I can extend this branch and take it further down if I wanted to. So let's improve it a little more. So that's yet another variation. So if I can show you those three. They're so different, so, so different. I've got a cascade, I've got a broom style, and I've got a standard type tree, all from these very humble little mugo pines. So those were the ones. Now let me see what we can do with the ones that I've grown from seed for the last seven years. Again, there's lots of mycelium there, so all pines produce mycelium. And the trunks are very interesting in this. And uh, again, because I've got this very long branch, I think I can make this also into a type of cascade or semi-cascade. So let's wire this up and see what effect I get. So let me just put one piece of wire across those two. So I'm using the two branch principle all the time. You notice I still haven't used my wire cutter. I'm just using the secateurs right through. So there's no excuse. Even if you don't have bonsai tools, it doesn't mean you can't make bonsai. Okay, let's do this. Two branch principle. So I'm wiring this branch and the one going to the top. You see how these mugo pines bud back from the old wood. See, that's a new shoot coming. That's a new shoot. So they do bud back very readily. So don't be afraid of uh, them looking straggly because they will dead up. And if you take the tips out, it will encourage back budding even more. A 
Okay, one piece of wire. So, and then let's wire these two little ones as well first. So, the principle every time is to wire everything, wire everything in sight. And once you've done the wiring, you can then twist it and play with it till you get the right shape that pleases you. So again, this tree has just got four branches, these two and those two. So we're wiring everything. So four branches means just two wires. Okay, I wired them up. And now let's give this a little twist, really contorted twist make it really twist. The beauty of pines and larches, usually most conifers, they are so pliable that you can twist it however hard you wish and they will always turn out nice and there is no fear of snapping or breaking. This is why when I conduct our classes we always ask people to work on conifers because there's no fear of breaking them and you always get some very nice shapes. So larches and pines are my favorite subject for working on in classes. The juniper is less pliable and when it comes to the San Jose juniper, that can be very brittle. So San Jose juniper, you've got to be just a bit careful. Now this one is a branch on its own, so what can I do with that? Because it's on its own, I can see there's another tiny little branch at the top there, so I'll go to the top. So let's wire this little fellow here and then take it up to the top and then I'll see what I can do with this. Again, we've got like a semi-cascade emerging from this. So, I still reckon it's virtually impossible to get a tree that cannot be turned into bonsai. It's very seldom that you come across really impossible material. I know that there are impossible material, but very seldom have I come across a tree that you can't do anything with. However difficult it seems, there is always a solution. Like everything else in life, there's always a solution. Don't be put off. <coughs> now here I've done cascade or semi-cascade going this way. <coughs> I have teased the pot. But look at that, for a first attempt, and I could have easily done that in about four or five minutes. So that was something which looked so difficult, but it turned out to be like this. And now let's see what we can do with this final one here. So this is a mugo pine that we grew from seed maybe five years ago. and. Uh, it was just grown in this little spot and the wild seedlings from our conifer hedge or the neighbor's conifer hedge has fallen into the soil and this weed is as big if not bigger than the pine that is growing there. By the way, this Leyland cypress, Leylandii camisipris, Leylandii, they are almost impossible to use for bonsai. But if you want to do something to it, you can, you can give it a try. 
So what I would do rather than just throw it away, just let me just show you what I would do with this. Leyland Cypress. This is the curse of all gardeners, absolute curse. I will just put one piece of wire, wire it up into an S shape. In my early bonsai days, I didn't know better, so I used to even use Leyland Cypress. While they were young, they look nice, but as they get older, they're very hard to control, so it has a limited life as a bonsai, but they can be wired. So let's do a little bonsai to show that, you know, I was saying there's no such thing as an impossible tree. Look at that, one piece of wire, I've changed the shape already. I've changed the shape already and I haven't even wired the branches. And if I were to put it in, I don't have a pot to hand. What was that? One piece of wire and it's looking like that. So the humble Leyland Cypress can be made into bonsai. I dare say someone would want to buy this. <laughs> anyway, let's not be distracted. So let's go on to this mugo pine here. So I've taken it out of the pot. Again, the principle is to find the branches and wire everything. So if there's anything you will have learned today is that when you get situations like this, especially with these straggly pines, just wire everything in sight and then think of shaping it once you've done the wire. wiring. Let's wire the matching pairs of branches. So that pair and this pair, they are the same thickness, so we will wire them. I've got to know and judge how much wire I need, so you will see that I seldom waste the wire. Let me just prop it up so that I can stand up. So this, these two are the next. I'm using two and a half mil wire, but as I say, you've got to just judge for yourself what wire will do the job. Now this one is on its own, so if it's on its own I'll find a branch that is already wired and wire that. So I've reverted now to one and a half mil. So I'm going to wire this and this. Okay, that's just to provide the anchor, and then I go out to this one. Okay, all the branches are wired, so let's see what we can create out of this. So, bend it really, really tight, get it tight. I've looped it so that I shortened the branch. So 
I've got that shape out of it or if I want to make the branch look as if it comes from a higher point I will go that a bit higher and let the branch come from there and see what happens. I think these can be wired as well. I'm not teaching you how to do sophisticated trees. I'm just showing you how you can achieve these results from very simple material so that it is within your capability. So that again is the classic S shape. But the point of doing this was just to show you that there is no such thing as the impossible material. So even that has turned out quite nice. So every tree that we've worked is uh, usable since I'm sitting here or standing here, this is a odd pine that I've strayed in, and this is not a mugo pine. This is an Austrian black pine, and it's a grafted tree. Look, the graft is still there. So that's the original graft. It's grafted onto Scots pine, and you see how it breaks back. You see all these buds breaking on old wood. It's just to show you that many people think that pines, certainly Scots pines and muco pines, don't break back easily, but they do break back very easily. So what can we do with this? You know, you often get material like this, so you ask yourself, what can you do with this? Yes, you can do something. So anything tall and lanky like this lends itself to literati, lends itself to literati. So the most ugly plants turn out to be the most sublime because the literati shape for those of you who are not much into the art of literati literati is one of the most sophisticated shapes for the Chinese scholars only the learned people the literati intelligentsia could conceive of the literati style and the literati shape so let us put a piece of wire. I'm using here three and a half mil wire because the trunk is quite thick and hopefully with one piece of wire I may be able to bend it but as I say if one piece of wire is not strong enough I will always go to a double coil of wire. But let's see if one piece does it and I always have pretty good judgment. I virtually come to the top without wasting wire. And now I literally bend it as much as I can. I'm just going to prop this tree up in a temporary pot so that it can stand up and see what shape I can get. Now, although that piece of wire has bent that trunk, I'm going to put another piece of wire so that I can get an even more intense bend. So I'm continuing to wire with the second piece of wire. I'm using slightly thinner wire. So I've used three and now I'm using two and a half. 
and going right to the top as far as it will go. And now I will see if I can get a more intense bend. So I'm just playing around with the shape to see what shape emerges. That won't work. This is probably better. So let me pluck some of these needles because I can't see any branches. But if I pluck the needles off, I will find the branches. I will put yet another piece of wire to see if I can f create a slightly different shape. So I will wire the sponge. I don't have any plan in mind. I just want to see what emerges. This is how I work. It may work for you, it may not work for you, but I'm just passing on what I do. So I'm not going to pot it in its literati pot, but that's the shape I've achieved looking at it from this side. These branches, I'll let them grow. They may be sacrificial to help to thicken the trunk and give more character to the trunk. But I'll try and set the trunk in that shape. And that is your classic literati. Anything which is tall and with dramatic trunk line is termed the literati style. So. I hope you've enjoyed this video dealing with these almost impossible pines. But these are typical of the types of nursery plants that you can get. And every single one of them turns out to be nice. So we look at each of these in turn. And I hope you've enjoyed this video.